all those guys used to come see us in Seattle. I mean, we had members of Pearl Jam see us before they were Pearl Jam. We had Alice in Chains open for us when nobody knew who they were. And they freaked on the harmonies and stuff, and they weren't a band of harmonies. It wasn't until they played with us that they kind of changed into that, and it worked really well for them. That's Ty Tabor. I'm Jamie Green, and this is Trading Force. I'm going to Kansas City. Kansas City, here I come. Oh, yeah. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another edition of Trading Force. And guess what, people? It's our two year anniversary. Two years ago today, the first episode of Trading Force went up. I went over to Matt Hopper's house, the jazz guitarist here in town, had a great chat. A little uncomfortable at first. Took a little while to kind of get into a groove, but hey, I think we're doing better, right? And I can't tell you. So if I could go back in time to 1989 when I worked at Pickles Records and Tape and fell in love with an album called Gretchen Goes to Nebraska, and not just because I was from Nebraska, but because the cassette, yes, cassette, was amazing and i told that person that 21 year old hey in 32 years ty tabor's gonna come to your house the guitar player of king's x he's coming to your house and he's gonna hang out for an hour and talk to you all about his solo stuff his band jelly jam and of course king's x and just a little program note about this episode you're gonna hear somebody talking in the background a couple times no i do not have a squatter in my house it is actually a documentarian that came along with Ty. They are shooting a documentary about uh, King's X. So he came to shoot some video while uh, I was interviewing Ty. So you're probably going to hear that guy, and that's what's going on. So this schmo might actually be in King's X documentary if I don't end up on the cutting room floor. Okay. Super stoked that this worked out for the second year anniversary that Ty Tabor... If, if you know anything about King's X, you know this is a band that is so well respected by fellow musicians. You know this is a band that brings it every night when they play live. Uh, And we had a great chat. And Ty, I I didn't know this that much about uh, Ty's personal thing, but apparently Ty's pretty shy. So the fact that Ty would take the time and come out and say hello and spend some time with me and talk about music uh, speaks even better about him. So super stoked for this one. You know what I'm going to say. Let's get started. Here's my conversation with Ty Tabor. Well, I, I think a good place to start with is happy belated birthday, man. Oh, well, thank you. appreciate that. So, you know, when I turned 50, that was the first one that kind of hit me in the gut a little bit. How was 60 feel? Is it? It was a big hit in the gut. 50 was big for me too, but I got over it. 60 hit so hard that I don't know how long it's going to take to get over it. <laughs> but I really just did not want to be 60 yet. I want to live long and healthy life as I possibly can, obviously. Right. I just didn't want it to get here yet. You know, 60 feels like you've already gone through most of your life and I don't want to think like that. Right. (laughs) No, it's funny how it just starts to fly about 40 on, doesn't it? It just seems like it's like, and it flies by. Um, Well, obviously I've been aware of you for a very long time and had heard through the grapevine that you live here. Yeah, I do. But uh, I'm not a stalker, so I never try to find you or anything. (laughs) So, you know, but I read the the book where it was all, you guys are being interviewed um, a while ago. And I think we have something in common. My wife is from a huge family here in Kansas City. Oh, cool. And that's why I'm here in big, huge Irish Catholic family. Every stereotype you can imagine is true. And I, I know that's the same for you. So yeah, tell right. me about Kansas City. What do you like about it? And how's it been living here? Well, the greatest thing to me about Kansas City is that, you know, I've been coming here since early 80s playing. And until I lived here, I didn't know this town at all. And I thought I did. Uh, But after I lived here, I discovered there is so much about this city that people don't know. So many unbelievable places to go and things to do. And the fact that this town does a lot of outdoor gatherings and thing as a city, whether it's lighting of the lights, you know, or, Mm -hmm. or whatever, or the, you know, where they have the boats on the the river thing. I mean, this city loves to celebrate things and it's a very happy place with a lot of beautiful areas 
that I never knew about when I was just coming through to play shows. Right. So that was the biggest thing about this place. I fell in love with the city once I could live here and really learn the city. And so I've been here uh, over over 10 years now. Okay. And uh, it's definitely home. Yeah, I always tell people on the outside that it stinks because I don't want anybody to move here and ruin it, right? That's always like, yeah, don't come here. No, it's not fun. It's not right. Because it's kind of a nice secret to have. It is a nice secret. And I'm worried about that too, because the secret tried to get out here recently in a bunch of articles about this city and how it's growing and that people are moving here. And I was like, please don't ruin our place. Right. (laughs) It's the best kept secret in the world. And it's great because it is the best kept secret. Absolutely. And I'm guessing as a musician that has to, well, before COVID, tours all over and goes over being centrally located it's probably kind of nice too yeah right? it does work well i it, you know i never have more than half the country to travel because i'm right in the middle of it right totally well another thing i wanted to ask about and it's kind of funny it reminds me of when we used to be in school and they'd be like how was your summer vacation so it's, ty how was your quarantine <laughs> it's actually been going good um i mean at first i didn't know what the heck i was going to do and i was worried about losing my studio and you know there no i mean touring income is the majority of our income right And to just suddenly be jobless for an indefinite amount of time, which is still indefinite right now, um, that definitely was a hard one to try to figure out. But I decided to start a Patreon channel and uh, kind of push myself out of my box because I I, I don't really like doing that stuff. I'm very private for the most part. Right. Um, But... It was really good for me to do that because the fans have really gotten involved in it and supported me to the point that it's allowed me to keep my studio and not have to worry about it too much. And while I recorded a new solo album, that'll be out in November. Right. And I'm still recording stuff right now for even future things. And uh, we also recorded some stuff in my place for the King's X album. I had to do some additional vocals. And that's wrapped up and done now too. And that'll be out before too long. But that's what I've been doing is I've been just in the studio literally almost every single day during the whole time, trying to be productive and make the most of it. So for some ways it probably hasn't changed. I mean, obviously that not being on the road changed, but the fact that you're usual when you're in town kind of life is fairly similar. Would that be correct? It's exactly like it always is when I just normally live here with the exception of for months and months, I didn't go to a grocery store. Mm -hmm. You know, I just did the pickup and stuff like that. Oh yeah. We're still doing the pickup. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) We still do too. Sometimes we do too. Sometimes. Yes. Uh, Well, we're, we're very paranoid and just try to stay out of Oh, yeah. Well, it's funny because I've worked out of my home for 10 years. So that was kind of, but then my wife literally came home on like a Thursday afternoon. It's like, oh, they send us all home. And I was like, what? And so that, because she works for a law firm down on the plaza. And apparently somebody had been exposed. This is way early. This is like March 12th early. And she's upstairs there working right now, man. She hasn't been back. It's crazy how it's just changed. And then for a while, we had everybody home. Same exact thing for my lady. She has a very, very nice corporate job. And she has worked from home now for a long time. Just turned her home office into the thing. Yeah. And uh, it works great. They got, they're getting stuff done in some ways better because there's no having to go 10 floors to talk somebody and run down the hall and all that stuff yeah everybody's just on yeah and uh it works really well for them she loves it too she does too because it's the first time in her life she doesn't have to commute so she actually has been working out every day and like you know awesome so it's great so uh god there's so many things to ask you about but you know rick beato has been loving you and and your band a lot (laughs) lately and this is a guy that you know for nerds like me and probably like you watch his channel a lot. So that yeah. must've been fun for you. Well, it was an honor for sure. I, I, you know, I'd never in a million years expected him to throw me up there with the stuff he's doing and he's done it a couple of times now. So it's, it's been an uh, amazing honor. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, the way I found out about it was, you know, I think maybe Wally Farkas, who's my best friend. I think maybe he told me cause yeah. <laughs> cause I don't, I don't keep up with the, uh, with stuff very well I, I find out from everybody else what's going on mm-hmm. as concerning me you know in the press and stuff usually uh hey man do you see blah 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 no i didn't had no idea about that you know it's usually the answer so i i don't you know run those things down or keep up with it but i hear about things you know from my friends and that's great because it's just what a cool thing to have somebody you know obviously rick's got a great ear oh he's he's great and a great player and understands what he's talking about and it's very informative yeah, yeah, because he really does know what he's talking about. Now, you know, one of the things I was thinking, too, so I play a little bit of guitar, obviously. And so it's so interesting to me. Drop D happened a little bit. I mean, obviously, like Unchained, 
drop D song and stuff like that. But you're and like Brian, the right Brian May too, right? Was doing it and Mississippi blues guys were doing it way before any of them were. Yeah, but you were like the first mainstream band. So was it the heaviness that you wanted out of it? Was it just you're messing around and you liked the sound of it? What drew you to become a drop D guy? It was both of those things. To me, the guitar sounded way heavier in drop D than it did in E. And it caused, uh, it opened up the ability for extreme riffage without a lot of chordal stuff, even though it is chords because the top two now are a chord right. when you're drop D. So you're just, bah, bah, bah. you can do any riff you want and it's a real heavy riff. And yeah, the lower string just added a darkness to everything that was what I was trying to get to. And um, not necessarily darkness as much as ominous yeah feeling kind of thing and i just like that that and i remember we did our first album and almost every song on the record is drop d right and we recorded that in i think 87 and um all the songs had been written like 85 eight you know and, and that kind of thing and i remember my my friend wally i just mentioned he heard that album back then and didn't know us yet. And he was just, the, his number one comment the first time through was, everything's in the same key. <laughs> <laughs> so people weren't trained for things being that way at all. When we put that album out, it was very unusual to have almost an entire drop D album. Yeah. And uh, it just, no one was doing that yet. Uh, and so people did comment on everything's indeed, you know, like it was a big deal that, you know, you're not supposed to play in the same key all the time, well, but we just love the way it sounded. So we did. Yeah. And you know, it's fascinating to me because the drop D sound was such a grunge thing that you guys were beating out by a good five, six, seven years. I mean, Alice in Chains and uh, Soundgarden and, uh, you know, uh, Evenflow is a drop D, like everybody, like you guys were kind of on the vanguard and didn't even know it. Right, we didn't, but all those guys used to come see us in Seattle. I mean, we had members of Pearl Jam see us before they were Pearl Jam. We had Alice in Chains open for us when nobody knew who they were. And they freaked on the harmonies and stuff, and they weren't a band of harmonies. It wasn't until they played with us that they kind of changed into that, and it worked really well for them. But all of those bands heard us playing Drop D before they, they were even... Pearl Jam didn't have a record out. They right. didn't even exist yet, you know. It's more like Mother Love Bone era. When it was, was Mother Love Bone era. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's funny just because uh, it's such the sound of grunge, but I guess you should guys, you guys should probably get a little bit of, you know, I don't know if it's a little monetary or at least, <laughs> at least a little bit of, I know they, I, they all love you guys, but. Well, they give us, they give us credit. Uh, I mean, uh, Jeff Amon from Pearl Jam said somewhere that he, they, somebody asked him, what does it feel like to be the band that created grunge? He said, I don't know. You have to ask King's X. Right. And, um, and he believes that, you know, that, that where he heard it first was us coming through Seattle and everybody thought we stuck out like a sore thumb and like, what is this? You know? Right. But he loved it. And um, uh, there were a few people there that loved it that we still are in contact with. No, that's great. Well, the first way I became aware of you and my friend David in Los Angeles, uh, the one that's friends with Jason Faulkner, warned me, don't talk about this too much because you're going to bore everybody. But since I'm from Nebraska, <laughs> I was working in the record store, literally, you know, putting the cassettes because this is how long ago this is. And this thing is like Gretchen goes to Nebraska. Right. <laughs> and that's the, how I. So you got one fan, at least solely off of the album title. So um, that's pretty cool that, you know, I know a, after, you know, we had the Bruce Springsteen Nebraska album, but that was all about Charlie Starkwater being, a, you know, a, a spree killer and not really that great for Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, talking of dark, about dark. <laughs> yeah, totally dark. Um, so that was what, 89? It was a way of I don't even remember what year. Yeah, it was a while ago, but that's how I, I became a huge fan. Yeah, Gretchen then. was 89. Yes, yes. 88, that, 88 was out of the silent planet, 89 Gretchen. Yeah. So I heard somewhere it was just because somebody like, on your tour, like, I don't know if it was a roadie or a manager or something, just had to drive all the way across Nebraska and said, holy shit, this is a long, boring drive. And that's kind of what, the, what was the no, impetus? It had, no, it had nothing to do with that. Okay. Well, see, now you can, you can give me an education. What was it about really? <laughs> it was about an album we did in 1983 that, and, and w originally we were called The Edge. Mm -hmm. It was me, Doug and Jerry, and we had another guitarist named Dan McCullum. And Dan, after a few months, he was about to get married and everything. And he realized, you know, he needed to get on with his life. And he decided to leave the band. 
And so then a friend of mine from Mississippi named Kirk Henderson temporarily for a while joined the band. But by 83, they both had left and we were just us three left. And we changed the name of the band to Sneak Preview. And we did an album then that is absolutely horrible. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the worst. It is one of the worst albums. You know, all your super fans are listening to this now and are running out to try to find a oh, copy good luck. of it. <laughs> good luck. I probably have the last unopened copy of that on earth in uh, my studio. That's funny. But um, I, I, I have a few of those and I listened to it the other day and was just in horror yeah like i hope this never gets out in mass Man, you better burn it dude because like look at prince you know you die and yeah right anything yeah. that's been out there in the vault somebody wants to make a buck off i'm sorry finish your gretchen part i, I interrupted you. oh uh, well basically we came back from a doing some shows and we had that album and we were kind of we 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 thought we can't sell this record to people we just felt this is this is just isn't good enough we can't sell this so we would use the album because we were playing clubs where we'd have to play a few cover tunes and then we would always sneak some, sneak some originals in too because we weren't going to play unless we did some originals. Right. But we'd do some cover and then originals. And uh, what we would do when we do our covers, I mean, our originals, usually the dance floor would empty. Mm -hmm. And so we'd go, hey, first five people on the dance floor get a free album. And we'd just toss them like a Frisbee out there and then they'd dance to our stuff. And because uh, they got a free album, I'm pretty happy about it. And so that's... We came back from one of those shows and we're feeling really embarrassed about the, the way we, we look on the album and the way it sounds. And uh, we just started making fun of the album and calling it different names and stuff, uh, just, you know, ridiculous names. And uh, one of our techs at the time, uh, Kevin Morning, who lives in Springfield, Missouri, he was just he just suggested out loud, you ought to call your next album Gretchen Goes to Nebraska. And we all just cracked up laughing because it was a funny sounding album title. And then we all looked at each other and said, you know what? We better make an album called that someday. And we died laughing about it. And we kept that with us. We had no idea when that was going to happen. But after the second album, the first thing we did was say, hey, is it time for Gretchen? And it was like, yeah. And so Jerry wrote this whole story and everything. To yeah, make it wouldn't it. make any sense to me. Does it make any sense to you? I mean, I, I, I tried to read it and be like, what? I don't understand. If you know, if you know Jerry, <laughs> okay. it makes sense. Okay. If you don't know Jerry, <laughs> it's way out there. Right. <laughs> so the other thing too, uh, and you know, we talked a little on law, offline about this. So my dad was a jazz musician. So I'm obviously really, you know, Ty, you're like the 85th person that I have interviewed for this podcast. And I would say probably 90% come from musical families okay and i think that's really interesting and, and it's not only interesting it's just kind of this great way to honor the generation before you right and carry that tradition on and how you, that connection stuff so tell me a little bit about your dad I'm, I'm curious about that relationship he was an amazing uh like bluegrass soul you know he had the feel for it and uh he always encouraged us and bought us great instruments young I'd always watch him play, you know, and just study. And he'd go to work and then I'd grab his guitar without him knowing and try to put my finger somewhere where I saw he did until I started figuring out something. I figured out G chord one time. Right. He came home from work and was like, look, and I played it for him. And then so he started teaching me chords and uh, and he would sing with me. Uh, and this is like really young. And uh, like by, by eight, I was jamming songs and stuff, you know, and uh, doing harmonies and everything. But he's the one that taught me to sing harmonies. He would start singing a song and go, now you sing this note. And I would. And it's like, ah, you know. Right. Yeah. Light bulb go on. Yeah. And so he really did teach me everything of the basics early on and encourage me in every possible way all the way till he died. Just a great encouragement. Always behind me. Yeah. Yeah, I still think of my dad when I get up and play on stage. Still, it's just something about it. Just kind of a, I don't know. It just kind of touches you in a way, doesn't yeah, it? He's always with me. That's for sure. Absolutely. So you got a you got a bum pinky, man. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I was hang gliding in the Adirondacks, and uh, I had a I had a cousin in law tell me the other day I need to just make up stories like that and right? not tell, not tell the truth because it is so ridiculous. I I heard it really bad. Uh, loading up the dishwasher okay and uh, i was about to drop a plate that i knew was real important to my lady and i was swinging back around with this hand to help grab it with the other hand as fast as i possibly could and i caught something 
like I'm not even exactly sure what I caught, but it had to be just the edge of the counter, I guess, because it was like dead stop, like, bam, punching as hard as you could into it. And it swelled up immediately and I knew it was broken. And uh, then shortly afterwards realized it was broken in two places. Ouch. And uh, it's, it's right at six weeks. And uh, I just started physical therapy in the last week and starting to try to get movement back, but I'm still keeping this on some because it still hurts to touch it on anything. And just needs to heal for a while. Well, you need that pinky, man. Yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, the, I mean, it would have been much better on your right hand. At least you could have been like, well, I can live without it. Right. The fair, I'm supposed to do the physical therapy till January. Okay. And, and if I do by January, I'm, it's supposed to be fine, be normal. So but, did that cause a, any of your recording stuff you had to put on hold then? Yeah, all of anything guitar is on hold. I can't do until I don't know when I'm going to be able to. You know, I'll just be working on it until I can. Yeah. And hope that they know what they're talking about and that by January it'll be normal. Well, I hope so too. Cause that's, I mean, not only is that your, you know, your way that you make money, but it's, you know, the, the way that you do the thing you love. So yeah. like, I one time uh, went to grab a Wawa pedal out of a bag and it, I sliced my finger all on the side of it and it was this finger mm. and we had a gig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was fun. <laughs> I've, uh, <laughs> I've done uh gigs with king's x like that with super glue to hold oh, it together yeah. just so you can do the show right that's like the steve ray vaughn thing right that was always what he did he would super glue but uh i don't know why guitar players it always seems like we beat the shit out of our hands i don't know but i i do i've got scars all over my hands i've been cut so many times it's it's i i think too fast and don't worry about what i'm doing and i get hurt doing mundane things because of that and on the other hand i'm a bit of a thrill seeker who likes to do stuff that's dangerous all my life. I've liked to do things that were a real thrill. And I've always been mostly safe with that. Never hurt. It's just stupid things, you know, normal right. daily stuff. Totally. Um, so let's talk about the new albums, man. Let's first talk about the solo one first. So okay. when, when's it coming out? When's it done? It's supposed to be out November 26th. Okay. What's Black that? Friday. Is that the name of the album or just when it's coming out? That's when it's coming out. <laughs> What's the album name? Do you know? The yet? album's called Shades. Okay. And um, it covers some of the stuff that like the death of my dad. There are a couple of songs in there that really deal with that. Right. Uh, but a lot of it is kind of directions I haven't done in a, in a while. And I have no idea if people are going to like it or not. Doug heard it and he, he thinks it's like one of the best things I've done. And he listens to it a lot. He told me. Uh, so that's encouraging, but I have no idea what anybody else is going to think of it. I, I don't listen to it now. Okay. Uh, that's kind of how I am when I leave a project behind. You're done with it. Except for the latest King's X, which I'm still listening to because I really do like it. It's I think it's the best thing we've done since we were young. Well, that's great. So uh, it's coming out Black Friday vinyl and everything. You're going to get to do all that? There will be vinyl and different CD packages and you know different all kinds of stuff. Well, I got to have to have one because I'm a big, huge vinyl nerd. So oh, cool. uh, that'll be cool. Well, I'd heard, you know, I had Eric Dover on and he was like, yeah, we like to do vinyl, but like there's a backlog. Did you find that for you guys too? The only reason my album's coming out in November is because of the backlog of vinyl. Yeah. It's been done for a long time. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Of all the things, like these, all these weird, crazy things that you can't get even right. still 18 months into this. Yep. Yep. Um, it's tough with vinyl right now. The toughest it's been in a long time. Yeah, it's strange. Uh, and then the King's X next year? Uh, that's the that's the uh, intention. I certainly hope so. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be out next year because we're we're done and we're working on artwork and all the credits and stuff are done. And I mean, we're we're there, and it's almost completely finished. So it's cool that you love it. I, I do. We haven't worked that hard in a long time, and that's why I love it. Everybody stepped up hard and did their very best it was great so is it the harmonies that are catching you just the riffs what's what's everything, making you love this one um everything about it uh some of it musically is some of the most demanding stuff we've done in, in a very long time and then some of it's the most simple straight ahead beautiful stuff we've done in a long time even violins and things on a couple songs really and yeah so where'd you find them uh, in LA, there uh, our our producer Michael Parnon has a couple of people that he goes to that are just superb. Okay, and they really are. What they did was amazing. So did Michael write the charts out for him and do that? No, how did they do it? No, basically Doug sat there with them and hummed things and stuff. You know, like uh, one part they did was a guitar part that I intend I left out of the song because I didn't want to play that guitar part. 
but Doug really liked that melody. So he had the violins do it. And then it was perfect. Right. It was the perfect thing. Well, you're such a Beatles nut. This has got to be fun to have vinyl <laughs> or have violins. I mean, we were just talking about it. So sorry. No, that's like been I doing said. a lot of talking the last couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, it's the it's stupid just, guys with the, vi- the movie. No, he's been talking my head <laughs> off for like. <laughs> a whole lot of hours in the last few days. Yeah. All good. I won't torture you much longer. No, uh, it's all fine. It's no, all no, fine. no. So it's so yeah. You know that's. I just did. You watch the Paul McCartney thing with Rick Rubin I on Hulu? Of course, I had to. Right. And there is a lot of new info info in there. That's that really I cool. Didn't know. Yeah, it's great, great documentary. So interesting that those guys were that good. That I mean, obviously George Martin had a huge part with that. Yeah, he did. Um, but still. But he was helping mostly to facilitate what their dream was, what they were wanting, and, and was he knew how to do it mm-hmm. you know, and how to arrange things, you know. And he was a genius. George Martin is like he's one of the greatest producers he's ever been. With the Beatles, couldn't have been what they were without him. It was just a perfect marriage. Totally, it's, and it's just so cool. Um, I so I had some friends like when you talk to him about his guitar tones. So here's my theory about guitar tones. I think ninety percent of it comes from your heart. And through your fingers and it's you like if you picked up and plugged into my super champ you'd sound like you you're not gonna sound like me right i've learned that that is <laughs> that is the truth and i always thought of it as a curse because i would sometimes pick up a marshall or something and want that marshall tone that i hear somebody else playing and no matter what i do it sounds the same right and doug and jerry have always mm-hmm. laughed about it you know like it just still sounds the same and so they've always said it's in your hands, man. You can't really change that. And I used to get mad and, and think, I don't, I don't like what my hands are doing with this amp. I want another tone. And I finally one day just accepted that, that it is true. That's in the hands. Yeah. It's in the end spirit. Like you say, because yeah, you do poem and do techniques and things, infinite techniques and things just to play a simple guitar part that people wouldn't think about Mm -hmm. because it's just second nature after you've been doing it all your life. Right. But there is a lot involved in it and it sounding the way it does is it's just constructed with the hands. Well it just makes me laugh because yeah I see all these guys that just go crazy. They're just trying they're chasing this tone. They're chasing they want to sound like this guy is like it's not going to happen. You know it's just not you're going to be you. Uh, and then didn't you guys like used to put like fake things on your like rack to try to because weirdos would jump up on stage and take pictures of it is that we, true we did have that kind of stuff going <laughs> on where everybody in the industry i ever heard of and others that i've never have wanted to know how i got my tone and my thought was we finally have an album out that's something different than everything else in the industry and i don't necessarily want to you know just give this away and suddenly we're just another one in the pile that didn't even matter and uh so at first i had those kind of thoughts which are really stupid i didn't but you're young right yeah right yeah. Yeah. but once i so we did things uh jokingly at a certain point after i realized it, it you know i had good friends from other bands i was just telling them that the other day the film guys that i had i've had friends that were famous grab my guitar or even grab their guitar and play through my rig and then they, them just go, oh, right. you know, because it's like, oh, I, that that's it. And I was like, yeah, you kind of have to play it a certain way to make it work with the sound. And and everybody's been shocked at, at how terrible it sounds when they plug into it. And um, so I accepted eventually that it's all about the hands and how you make that thing get that tone, whatever it is. And it is the infinite little things that you could talk about and do multiple podcasts over that that is doing that yeah well and, and it, i think it's a credit to you i know like you know new to new to Betancourt has said really nice things about a lot of great guitar players um uh it's a i i love your sound i think a lot of it too is the arpeggiating that you've always done so much and i don't know if that was to fill out because you're just a three-piece or your bluegrass roots or what made you always it just it's just you what made you be an arpeggio guy like so much you arpeggiate a ton of chords when you play i don't know uh be honest it, most likely everything that i built a foundation on came from the beatles originally because growing up that's the only thing i wanted to hear was beatles and they were still a band right <clears throat> still putting out new stuff and even though i was young i was aware of it excited about it and every birthday or christmas the only thing i wanted was a, the net the beatle records you know and lucky for me 
had a next door neighbor who was a great guitar player named Mickey Pogue. And <clears throat> Mickey's one of the best uh, unknown guitar players that's ever lived. He passed away recently too, but Mickey was very special on guitar, real touch. And that taught me so much because I would watch him play and he could do one note mm. and it meant more than anything else anybody else was doing. And, you know, like Jeff Beck can do or right. Brian May can do. Yep. And I realized there's, you know, it's all about touch. It's not about anything else, but touch when it comes down to it. And, um, so I love those players that sound like themselves, no matter what they grab. And I always thought of it as my curse. Uh, but now I just understand, I get it. I understand. And that's just how it's going to be. Yeah. I, I think, uh, well, the fact that you've got all these nerds running around trying to sound like you, I mean, I, that, that's a credit to you, right? It's like, you know, nobody's, well, I, nobody's trying to sound like me, Ty. <laughs> <laughs> that's an honor that anybody's wanting filming all over the country. They filmed while we were recording the new album. It's, they've got so much stuff that they can do five documentaries at this so point. So how'd you hook up with these guys? Well, um, they just contacted us. Uh, he was part of a movie that uh, was being played on TV that I had just seen. And then he contacted us and, and uh, our manager told me this guy named Roy Turner, who was involved in blah, blah, blah movie is saying he he's interested in possibly doing a documentary on you guys. And, and I just seen his documentary and uh, the one he was involved in. And I thought that was a really good documentary. So this dude's legit. And at that point we just said, sure. And uh, he started filming right away and it was probably two over two years later before we even signed an agreement or whatever. Oh, really? Yeah. And he'd already put loads of money into it and stuff, but they're doing it right. And the stuff that we've seen looks phenomenal. Oh, good. It looks really good. They're definitely doing it right. Well, it's kind of, have you had other ones made of you before? Somebody's probably done something, nothing. There have been people offered to, and we've just never taken them up on it because I would check out their work and stuff. And I would think, I just need to wait till it's going to be on a different level. Well, we were laughing because, you know, I'm stuck at home still. It's better with good at, but when it was really stuck at home, couldn't do anything. So I just would like scroll through and I like documentaries. I like to watch that. Me know, too. Right? That's almost all I watch is documentaries in general. But there was one on Brian Jones. I was like, okay, they didn't have any money to buy any of the Rolling Stones music. They didn't talk to anybody like that you know of. Like everybody they're talking to is like Brian Jones's neighbor for six months in 19, right? And you're like, and you turn it off because it's like this isn't interesting at right. all. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, it's cool that these guys are doing it for the long haul and trying to get you know the backstory. And I imagine they're around this much. You probably guys are used to them being around. You don't even think about it anymore. Uh, when they come around, yeah, it's just normal. They they just kind of hang out and they leave mics and stuff around, so everything's getting captured, you know. And who knows what's going to be in the movie? Yeah, but uh, we have first right of refusal. Refusal, so that's big. We can keep anything ridiculous from getting in there. Well, that's big because I've seen some rock documentaries that weren't the most flattering things, right? So, right. Uh, well, I won't keep you all day. It, it's so much fun to talk to you, though. Uh, and I, I appreciate it. this is actually going to go out on October 30th, which will be my two year anniversary. So getting awesome. to talk to you, make it a, a, a local guy now. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's really special. And uh, looking forward to the new album and looking forward to everything you do. Um, I, I did want to ask you because I saw and, and I think I know the answer to this, but you said and you like Lindsey Buckingham. Yeah, I and, like his guitar playing. Right. He's so underrated. I actually love his voice too. I love his songwriting. Uh, yeah, he is definitely underrated. He's a huge in, impact on me, big influence. You know, and it's one of those things where it's like this finger picking, but it's not like what you would think finger picking would do. Like you can tell he's self-taught. Yeah. But it's just brilliant. It's creative in a yeah brilliant way. But to me, the Buckingham Knicks album before he even joined Fleetwood Mac is one of my all-time favorite albums that of anybody ever. And his guitar playing on that record is supreme and subtle. Mm. I mean, there are things he's doing in there that you wouldn't really think about, but if you stop and think about it, it's like, wow, what a perfect part that was. Yeah, he's coming in December. I'm thinking about going. If the world is is safe enough to get in a big crowd of people for I know. me. Does that make you scared? Yeah. I know it's like, dude, what's, is there a bigger mask than an N95? Can I get an N200 mask, right? Cause yeah. you're just like, but I got to see Living Color this summer outside. That's good. And, you know, outside, because it's better. Uh, it was part of the Summerland tour. And right. um, you toured with those guys. Those guys are great, man. They're still great. Yeah. 
Yeah, we've we've done a lot of shows with them, toured with them, done one offs with them. We 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 know them. Yeah. You kind of have parallel kind of careers where like you're loved by the musicians. You know, every musician loves you guys. Every musician loves Living Color. You both got that real taste early on of the MTV airplay, and everybody thought you know, and then it just kind. Of... We are a lot yeah. like that. Uh, we've known them since back then when their first album came out. They came through town and their management contacted our management and said, hey, you guys, let's go out to eat. We'd like to hang with you. And we were like, oh, yeah, that new that new band. Yeah. And, but we were a new band, too. But even though we'd been together for a long time, many years, as far as putting albums out and the world knowing about us, we were a brand new band. Uh, and But we knew about them. And it was like, yeah, let's go eat. And and so we met them that early on like that. And we've done a lot of things together. We seen each other at different gigs and stuff over the years. And Doug went actually on tour with them as lead singer in Europe uh, when Corey couldn't go for some reason. Okay. And so, yeah, we, we do have a kinship between the bands in some weird way. Well, that's cool. Us and, and 24 seven spies too. Oh yeah. Love those guys. They're great too. Yeah. Uh, only thing else I will say is, um, you get interviewed a lot and I, I've looked at some of your interviews and stuff. So what do people ask you that or never ask you that you're dying? You wish somebody would ask you something. Oh, about? I don't really have anything like that. You don't? When I put myself into interview situations, I put myself into things I don't really, uh, I'm not comfortable doing. Okay. I don't like uh, my words being copied and put out there because later I'll read them and go, oh, that didn't come out the way it should. And I, I hate seeing or hearing interviews with me and stuff like that so I it's always difficult for me to do it but I know that I, I need to and I really appreciate it when people want to because uh if it weren't for that uh I couldn't make a living you know yeah well I I hope I know you listened to some other ones I hope that you see that it comes from love for out of love on my part and it's not oh, gonna yeah it, it always feels that way for people who want to and I'm always honored and appreciative that somebody wants to um I'm just shy by nature. Okay. Uh, when I'm on my own, you know, I do a lot of just sitting home, at, you know, being quiet. And uh, me and my lady, both of us are, are very much home people. We don't go out and do anything unless uh, somebody's dragging us out. So I'm not going to see you at the Plaza Art Fair tomorrow, Ty? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the trepidation, were you always that way or was it when Rolling Stone hosed you? I'm always been. You've always uh, been that way, even before the Rolling Stone hatchet I, job. I think I was real outgoing when I was young. Okay. Like in high school and stuff, I was a lot more outgoing. But the the older I've gotten, the more reclusive I've gotten, and it's been the band that caused it. The more that attention started coming, the more that people started recognizing, the more that the waiter stays at the table for half the meal with your wife on your anniversary, trying to interview you. And you're like, the, uh, the more that life just starts becoming a hassle to get out and live it, uh, the more I, unhappy I became. And I, at that point, there was a period where I stopped doing interviews altogether and stopped putting my face out there. I just wanted to be left alone <laughs> because it was all starting to drive me insane. And I realized I was not cut out for that. I'm not an attention, you know, me, me, me person. I, I'm the one who would rather just stay in the dressing room. Doug and Jerry can go out and do everything but people get mad if I don't go out there with them. So I usually go out there just to be a team player. Right. But what I'd rather do is just be alone and left alone. It's kind of like Neil Peart was. Yeah. Very much like him because yeah. he loved to get on his motorcycle and travel alone yeah, and be left alone. And I loved that too, you know, taking a trip on the bike across the South in the swamps and stuff. I've done that. And that's where my soul is at. I love that alone thing. That's great. You just reach a Zen, you know, Okay. Last question, because I um, I love that when I see these videos of you guys playing Goldilocks and the crowd sings the entire thing. And I know you wrote that song and they actually they're doing the harmonies and stuff. <laughs> How satisfying is that to you as a songwriter that wrote that at some point in this song decades later? I mean, it, it almost makes you tear up a little bit watching. I see you have a big smile on your face now. And I know on those videos, there's one of them with like 2015 in Chicago. You have, I can see you smiling in the video. So how does that feel as an artist? It's incredible. I mean, I savor that every time we do it. I stop and, and make myself be in the moment and realize this, you know, if this is the last time this ever happens or you're ever on stage, live this moment, really live it, take it in. 
And every time we do that song, I stop and feel that way and make myself do that and with the most appreciation that I, I, I mean, it's overwhelming appreciation that that's even happening, you know, that anybody knows this song at all. Mm. And the fact that they are crying and singing harmonies and so happy. And it's, it's, it's hard to put that into words. It's such an honor. You know, it's just hard to put that into words. It does touch you, but in a very happy, peaceful, wonderful way that it's a gift every time that is something you never deserved or expected in your life at all. Every single time, it's just a gift. Absolutely. And every, every musician I've talked to during this, like that's what part they miss the most. It's that connection with the crowd, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And seeing that reaction when you play some song, right? And they don't know what's coming. And that's, I mean, I don't know how you put a price on that. King's X is a live band. Yeah. We make records, but we are a live band. We've always been known as a live band. That's what we live for. That's where the music really comes alive. And uh, we walk the plank every time doing things to throw each other off and create new ground and do things to not be comfortable in it, you know, and I love that. That's the kind of stuff that gives me a, the adrenaline rush and like, you know, you get scared. You know, I got to somehow pull this out that has now gone a different direction and everybody's gone with me. And but like I said, we call that walk in the plank and we do that to each other. Uh, and it's great. I love it every time it happens. I love it every time Jerry does something different or Doug does something different and we all adjust and yeah. don't know where we're going anymore. Well, I, I really appreciate the time. It's so great. Um, you're one of the few people who's got to come back in after we all got shot up. So I, I appreciate you coming over to my house and, yeah, and, and driving over. It's very kind of you. Hopefully it wasn't too far of a drive. No, actually the studio is uh, like six minutes from here. Well, that's great. Yeah uh next year 40th anniversary tour right that's the deal 40 <laughs> it's, it's a well they're calling they're supposed to be calling it that but it was the 40th anniversary uh you know last year or the year before right because uh, we started in, you know, last year it was 40 true 40th we started in 1980 yeah well i'm playing uh, a high school reunion class of 1990 reunion here in a few weeks that was supposed to be last summer right yeah that's just what everybody had to put everything on hold so mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's gonna like say, oh, no guys, it was really 42 now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, fun. Ty, thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you. Ty Tabor, everybody, and a little food for thought, right? Maybe, just maybe, grunge did not start in the late 80s and early 90s in Seattle. Maybe, just maybe, it started in Houston, Texas in the early to mid 80s because I'm telling you, man, you listen to those early King's X records and then you listen to what those bands that were greatly influenced by King's X out of Seattle and, and you read the quotes and they, they all talk about how much they love King's X. You could make that argument. So thanks so much to Ty Tabor. This is one of the tracks, this is what I was talking about, Goldilocks. They play this at the end. Uh, they don't sing a note. The crowd loves it so much, they sing the whole song to the band. It's awesome. I mean, it, that's what makes music special, is those connections. So down in the show notes, uh, Ty Tabor's Patreon page is there. Please, if you have some extra money and are a fan of what Ty is doing, help him out. Let's keep his studio open. Uh, also links to his website, King's X, all that good stuff and some clips. So that's going to do it this time. But uh, next time, Cassie Joy, Kansas City's own country sensation that was on The Voice. She's going to be here, and we're going to talk all about what she's up to. So until then, go out, support live music, and we'll talk real soon. Bye-bye. Oh.